Are you are you seeing my screen? Okay, let me go to presentation view. Okay, great. Everyone can see. Great. Thank you again. Good morning, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, I have just a few minutes to sort of give you a very quick overview of the wealth of Alexandria Black history that we have in our city. And as I say, this is a snapshot, just a very quick snapshot to sort of ground you in some of the major events and history uh, in our city, but it is by no means comprehensive. I'm also very happy today to be sharing the screen, the sharing screen time uh, with Dr. Kristen Moon and Dr. Daniel Lee, uh, colleagues that I've worked for, for for many years, and they are also a wealth of information on our city history, our African American history, and so we hope today that we can give you a really good grounding in some of the major issues uh, of, regarding Black history and also the history of immigration uh, in our community. So for my first slide, if you're not familiar with the museum, we are located at 902 Wift Street, and we are actually three sites. We are the Black History Museum, and part of the Black History Museum was the former Robert Robinson Library that was built in 1940 as a segregated uh, facility for African American residents. Adjacent to the museum is our Watson Reading Room. It contains close to 4,000 volumes on African and African American history. It's a non-circulating research repository where you can come in and you can research at the site. Unfortunately, you can't check out the books, but it does mean that what you're looking for is usually there when you, you come in and hasn't been checked out and you are welcome to come in and to make an appointment uh, to, do, to use our resources and of course to, uh, while you're there, see our museum. And then our third site is the African American Heritage Park, which is off of Duke Street on Holland Lane. It's a nine acre park that was dedicated in 1995. The reading room as well opened in 1995. The trees that you're seeing are three bronze sculptures down by Washington DC artist Jerome Meadows. The trees are called truths that rise from the roots remembered. And on two sides of each of the three bronze trees are the names of African Americans who have made a contribution to our city, as well as African American organizations, which were also important to the development of our city. In addition, the cemetery also preserves a one acre African American burial ground that dates to the late 19th century. And one of my colleagues, Amy Birch, has done some really interesting uh, research and genealogy work on some of those burials at that site. Before I delve into some of our sites, I have to ground us as we were grounded this morning uh, with our land acknowledgement, but ground us in our history of slavery in Alexandria. Uh, slavery infused our city um, from its founding uh, until 1861 in Alexandria with the occupation of Union troops. But slavery in Alexandria is a tragic and horrific uh, history that we really must acknowledge because our city was built on the labor of those enslaved. While we had a free black population, we did, um, our city was actually a hub for the domestic slave trade. And so when we're thinking about slavery in Alexandria, we want people to think and to ground themselves in what really happened to the men, women, and children who were trafficked through our city and those who were enslaved within our city. Uh, you see an ad in the picture that you have on screen uh, from the 18th century for an Im importing of Gambia slaves to the city of Alexandria. The other images that I used to set the stage is the very famous image of Anna Williams, who is jumping out of a window uh, in a tavern in 1815, Miller's Tavern in Washington, D.C. She was jumping out of that window to commit suicide because she was in despair. She had been taken from where she had been enslaved brought to Miller's Tavern because she had been sold. Her family had been sold and they were going to be split up. Her daughters were going to be sent elsewhere. She didn't know where her husband is uh, was. And so when they asked her, because she survived this fall, she broke her back, she broke her arms, but she did survive. And when she was asked about why, she said, I don't really know. I was so confused. Everything was taken away from me. And essentially she saw no other option. I use this slide because in the next slide, you'll see our site at 1315 Duke Street, where a woman we know of the name of Dorcas Allen, when she knew that she was coming to the infamous slave pen at 1315 Duke Street, 
strangle two of her four children and then tried to bludgeon the other two to death before she was stopped and had planned to kill herself because she knew what awaited them in this house on Duke Street and what awaited them in their future. Below the slave ad is a very famous folk art image from the early 19th century called Virginian Luxuries, where you see the sexual molestation of a slave woman and the beating of an enslaved man. And then the very famous image of Peter Gordon, often called Whipping Peter. He was a enslaved man who was enslaved on a plantation in Louisiana and he escaped. He ran away and he was actually able to find protection by the Union Army. And a Union Army doctor took this photograph. And this photograph circulated around the uh, country used by abolitionists to make people see the horrors of slavery before people would talk about it sort of in abstract terms, but you're actually seeing on his back what happened to him during the course of the time he was enslaved. Many of you know our Freedom House site or the Freedom House Museum located at 1315 Duke Street. At the height of the pandemic in March, the Office of Historic Alexandria, the city of Alexandria purchased this building from the Northern Virginia Urban League. We had been in collaboration with the Urban League since 2018, managing the museum, which was on the lower level. With the purchase of the building, we are still in collaboration with the Urban League. They will be in residence with us for five years. And we are excited about that because it is so important that an organization committed to empowerment for communities of color should be in this building, which was once a place of horror and terror for so many people. Now, right now, the Black History Museum, our Watson Reading Room, and Freedom House Museum are closed, but we anticipate opening in the fall. And what we see for Freedom House is not just a museum to the domestic slave trade, but also a hub for our social justice work in the city. We see this site as more than just a museum, but a place for reflection, for reconciliation, for true and honest discussions about the history of slavery in Alexandria. Many of you remember the exhibit that was on the lower level, an excellent exhibit that was done by the Urban League as a gift to the city of Alexandria. When the museum opens, and one thing that unfortunately, because the elevator in that building doesn't go to the bottom level, it wasn't fully accessible. But with our new renovation uh, uh, of the building, when you come in, exhibits will be moved to the first floor and the two upper levels. And you will be able to see not only a museum documenting and interpreting the history of the domestic slave trade, but also Alexandria Black history. There will be temporary exhibits on our second floor, our Sanabria painting exhibit on the third floor. So you will really be grounded in some of our early African-American history at this site. Freedom, Hi Freedom House was mainly known as the headquarters for the Franklin and Armfield slave dealing operation. They were one of the largest domestic slave traders in the country. Uh, but there were actually five different dealers who operated out of the site from 1828 until the occupation of the Union Army in May of 1861. One of the other things that we would like to do in the city is also really interpret the Duke Street corridor. Many of you drive up and down Duke Street, but really don't realize or think about the fact that this was a hub for our slave trade. And if you were African American in the 19th century, Duke Street would have been an area that would have brought fear to your heart. And you would have known that this would have been the area where you would have been separated from your family, from your mother, your father, your sister, your brother, your grandparents, if you were captured or, or sold by agents to Franklin and Armfield or any of the other uh, dealers that were working uh, in these sites. Here I'm showing you the Bruin slave jail and Bruin had been a former agent of uh, Franklin and Armfield. You would know that your fate would be unknown, but it would be horrible. You would be trafficked further south, either walking by foot in a coffle or you would be shipped by water down to the hubs, especially for Franklin and Armfield in Natchez and New Orleans. I highlight the Edmondson sisters here. Many of you probably passed this sculpture and we have put a new interpretive sign in front of the old Bruin slave uh, jail that's on Duke Street near the Table Talk restaurant. But stop if you will, it's an amazing story. There's a wonderful book, Escape on the Pearl by Mary Kay Ritz that goes into great detail about this story. But these two young women were part of the escape attempt on the schooner, the Pearl, 
1848. Uh, that escape, uh, unfortunately, did not happen. They were captured and brought here. And Bruin sent Mary and Emily Edmondson to New Orleans to hopefully, he was hoping, um, because they were young and attractive, to make them fancy girls or prostitutes. But luckily for the young women, yellow fever broke out in New Orleans and he shipped them back to Alexandria, which gave abolitionists time to raise money to free them. We dedicated in 2014 our Contrabands and Freedmen Cemetery Memorial, which is the site, the burial site of over 17 contraband or escaped slaves. When we were occupied by the Union Army in 1861, those who were enslaved in other areas in Virginia realized that they had an opportunity if they could get refuge with uh, the Union Army. They would have a chance to live independently, to work for a wage, and if the Union won the war, to be free. They were considered by the Union contraband or war of war or property of war, but their influx into Alexandria starting in 1861 created a huge humanitarian crisis. There was not adequate food, water, housing for these men, women, and children, and so many, many died very young. Many were buried in unmarked graves, some buried at what we now know as Penny Hill, but in 1864, the army created the Freedmen's or Contraband's uh, Cemetery here in Alexandria. When you enter the cemetery, you're walking in on the original carriage path that would bring the bodies into the cemetery, and we know from our work with Alexandria archaeology that over 600 and 90 burial shafts still survive at this site, and some even in the sidewalk. It's a moving story of those who came to Alexandria seeking freedom, but did not live long in it. And we have beautiful sculptures by Mario Chiodo and by the late uh, sculptor Joanne of Lake. We always fought for equity. The African-American community never was passive. When you think about contrabands who come in, it's a story of self-emancipation. They are taking their freedom into their own hands. Also, we have our USCT here, and they were also fighting for their rights. I love this photograph that I'm showing uh, that was taken by an aid walk worker in the 19th century, but he had the foresight to document the first and last name of every man in this photo in the position they were standing in. And he's been able, and now the owner of this photograph has been able to do extensive genealogy and we know what happened to every single person. And if you come to Freedom House when we reopen, you will learn the story of each and every one of those men. But their protest was because they, their comrades who died were being buried in the Freedman, the Contraband Cemetery. And they felt that that was an injustice, that they deserved to be buried in what was Alexandria's Soldiers Cemetery. And I show you a very early photograph of that site. So they crafted a petition, over 400 USCT assigned that petition. You can find it in the National Archives. We will be reproducing it in Freedom House when we reopen. And it said, we have served on the battlefield of war with our white brothers, but we want in dignity, what they wanted in dignity was to be buried with honors. And the army eventually accepted this petition and they were reinterred in the soldier cemetery, which we feel is really a very early right, very early action for African-American civil rights in Alexandria. Sadly, with the civil war, even though it brought the end of slavery, we did not see the end of racial terror, hate crimes for intimidation or the continued uh, control or continued use of white supremacy to control African American lives and bodies. In the 1890s, we had two documented lynchings here in Alexandria, Joseph McCoy in 1897 and Benjamin Thomas in 1899. We will be coming up on the remembrance for Benjamin Thomas on August 8th. We just recently had the remembrance for Joseph McCoy and we have installed a marker at the site at the corner of Lee and Cameron streets. And many people were out with us on April 23rd as we had a, a, a ceremony to remember Joseph McCoy and all victims of racial terror, hate crimes. I do wanna share the slide from April 23rd. Many of you probably saw the city hall was illuminated as was the Masonic Memorial. And I know people wanna know how they can get involved and how they can work with us. And one of the things that you can do is if you'd like to be a part of what we're doing for uh, Benjamin Thomas on August 8th, uh, we are actually looking for volunteers who want to help us on our journey. We have many great groups who are working with us through our Alexandria Community Remembrance Project. Before I talk about that, I do wanna mention 
our history of, of activism and fighting back. We had the USCT. We also know that there was a riot by African-American citizens in 1825 who were fighting uh, because they knew what was happening with the domestic slave trade here in Alexandria. But we also had wonderful leaders like um, Friedman Murray, who was not only a journalist, an art historian, uh, he was um, part of the early Niagara movement, which was a precursor uh, to the NAACP. He lived in Alexandria. He published a black newspaper called the Home News. And he also, uh, it's believed, tried to set up safe houses uh, for people, for African-Americans who are per who could possibly be lynching victims or victims of other kinds of persecution. Also, Dr. Durant. Many people know the Durant Center, but many people that was named after him, and he was a very dedicated dedicated worker for the NAACP, but many people don't realize that he was actually almost lynched himself when he was falsely accused of rape while he was in medical school at Meharry College in the 1920s in Nashville. Uh, he was exonerated. Uh, there was, he did absolutely nothing wrong, but it just goes to show you how, how um, difficult it was for African Americans who could be accused of crimes that they didn't commit at any time, something that certainly still goes on today. I would be remiss if I did not mention our historic 1939 library sit-in uh, with Samuel Wolbert Tucker. And here we have the arrest photo in 1939. Uh, Tucker, a uh, mastermind at this sit-in, our Alexandria Library uh, under the direction of Rose Dawson has done an amazing job to highlight this history. And with the last um, anniversary of, of the sit-in, um, just before the pandem pandemic, they were able to get the Commonwealth's attorney to drop the charges that still held against the five men who participated in this sit-in. After the sit-in in 39, the city built the 1940s Robert Robinson Library, but Tucker was never satisfied with that, never, as we know, set foot in this library. And there is a letter from him in the library's collection where he is not satisfied with this and does not consider it acceptable and only wants full integration. I also noticed that on this call, we have Dr. Brenda Mitchell Powell, who's written extensively about our Alexandria sit-in and also spoken about it. Uh, it's again, a story that you should explore if you are not aware of it. And because just there's a short amount of time, just there are other topics I can't go into, but I want to make you aware of them. Just last year, we had the 100th anniversary of the Parker Gray School. New um, markers are going up to talk about the history of the Parker Gray School. We have a new Parker Gray website where you can see some of the history. We have a chance for you to help the Black History Museum identify a photographs of students from Parker Gray School. And so I encourage you to follow and to look at our website. I'd also um, like to talk about, uh, and I have talked about in past presentations, Lois Hunley, and who was fired uh, as a cafeteria worker by T.C. Williams. And I know her name came up when we were looking at new names for uh, T.C. Williams School, but her story is amazing in and of itself. The construction of the Johnson Pool in 1952 after the deaths of the Johnson brothers who drowned in the Potomac as did other African-American children because there was not adequate or integrated recreation for them. Also the race riots that occurred after the death of Robin Gibson who uh, was killed in 1970 and was accused of stealing from a convenience store when he actually did not and the owner had planted uh, evidence on him. Those riots led to great unrest in the city and Ira Robinson, who helped to sort of calm the community and to work with the community, ended up shortly after that becoming our, our first black uh, city council member since Reconstruction. Also the secret seven African-American federal workers who met in secret to really push for change and reform in Alexandria. And they did their report on the 42 points that they sent to the city about what needed to be changed to bring equity to African-Americans. If you, again, just in the last few minutes, we'd love to have you join us on this journey. Uh, please join the Alexandria Community Remembrance Project, or if you can't join, please look at our website. We have dedicated subcommittees that work with us. We are working with EJI to bring our pillar from Alabama to Alexandria for installation in a prominent place. No community has received their pillar yet, but we are hoping that we, we are in the process of doing everything that we can with our community engagement to make that happen. And we'd love to have you on this journey. Also, after the death of George Floyd last year on May 25th, 2020, we launched our George Floyd Collecting in Initiative. 
This year, we rebranded that as our Black Lives Remembered collection because we wanted to broaden the scope and we wanted to hear from you in the community. And we have con collecting, we have hundreds of our articles in this collection that people in the city have donated to us all around the DMV. And these are what images that capture vigils and protests and we are still collecting. So if you have any of these signs, we would love to have them in our collection. Uh, I see this mural every morning as I am heading into work. It's all around us. We really, really want to make sure that we are capturing this moment in time. So please reach out to me if you have items. They can be poems, thoughts, recollections, uh, posters. We are interested in everything. If you'd like to find out more about Alexandria Black history, uh, we have our book, African Americans of Alexandria, Virginia. We also have a book on Freedmen's Cemetery. And coming in late 2021, we have a book on anthology on African American emancipation here in Alexandria. Again, I encourage you to visit our website to see our African American Heritage Trail, which was launched last year, uh, Juneteenth uh, information, Juneteenth is coming up, and our Black History Collections. And also look around you. There is African American history everywhere in Alexandria. This installation went in at the height of the pandemic, Wrought Knit Labor's Legacy by sculptor Oliveken Nyefus. It has now been moved to the Durant Center, so you can still see part of it, and are related to African American history as it relates to commerce. As I said, we have made a commitment in our department to infuse African American history throughout the city. That is what our mission is with the Office of Historic Alexandria. I invite you to join us on that journey. And, and now it's my great pleasure to turn the podium over to Dr. Kristen Moon of the University of Mary Washington and Dr. Daniel Lee, our historian for the Office of Historic Alexandria. Thank you. And I will stop my share. Are you all set? All right, I think she's all set. All right, so uh, Dr. Lee and I are now gonna pivot, I guess, to uh, talking about uh, immigration uh, here in the city of Alexandria, but immigration uh, writ large as well. Um, but we're gonna do it in a little different platform. We're gonna do it as sort of a question and answer, um, just to mix it up, make it a little bit more casual and sort of impromptu. Um, we're not gonna be able to cover everything, just a heads up. Um, because we don't have enough time. Uh, but please, that's where questions become critical. So uh, throw some questions in the chat, which we can talk about later. Um, Dan, you want to start with our questions? Or do you want to sure. add a little intro? What works best for you? Um, we can start with the questions. Can everyone hear me OK? Um, yeah. Not everyone. Yeah. Um, sometimes these headphones don't work all that well. But um, so let's start off with kind of like some big numbers. Um, yeah. Many of us have heard that there is a huge number of languages spoken in Alexandria public schools. Uh, could you give us a current number? Yeah, so we know um, from the US Census, which does a community survey basically every year, that we have, um, hold on, I want to make sure I give the right number, 132 different languages besides English spoken in ACPS, representing over 140 different nations. That means probably about 15,000 students or upwards of 50% of our student population speak an, a language other than English in our schools at home. Now, if they're doing that, that means they're probably either immigrants themselves or their parents are immigrants and they were born here, right? There are a lot of different familial structures that would be facilitating multiple languages being spoken in the home. Uh, in addition to that, it's also important to notice what languages are being spoken besides English. So Spanish is the most prominent which um, speaks to the demographics uh, for this region, particularly from Central America, but also from the Caribbean and South America. But followed by Spanish, we see uh, large numbers of Amharic uh, and Arabic speakers. Now, this is important, too, because this speaks to some particular demographics that have settled in Alexandria that make us distinct from the rest of Virginia. If you look at uh, languages spoken um, in households for the rest of Virginia, you'll notice that you see a large number of Asian immigrants, particularly Vietnamese, Chinese, and here we're talking about Mandarin and Cantonese, uh, Korean, and Tagalog, which is one of the major dialects of the Philippines. Um, so we have some something unique going on in Alexandria, um, both in terms of our hyperdiversity, but also the, the larger linguistic groups that we see um, being used in, in our schools too. So thanks, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, 
while immigration has always been a part of Alexandria's history, it seems that the number of new Alexandrians and the number of locations that they've arrived from has exploded. Um, yeah. Can you give us an idea of like, what are some of the factors that have caused that, especially, like, I guess, specific ones? Yeah. So really, um, when we're talking about these larger sort of phenomena, we have to look at American immigration law and what happened after World War II and how that has affected life on the ground, the realities on the ground. And there, in terms of post-World War II, there are two phenomena that are, are critical. First is the emergence of refugee law. Prior to World War II, there was no such thing as refugee law in the United States. We start passing refugee legislation in the late 1940s. Now, what's important here is what's driving that refugee legislation is not the Holocaust. In fact, because of anti-Semitism in the United States, we do very little to address the number of displaced persons because of the Holocaust. Our refugee policy from the late 1940s through the late 20th century is driven by our anxieties about communism and the Cold War. And so our, our, our laws in the late 1940s target very specific countries. It's sort of at an ad hoc basis, depending on the, um, the rise of communist regimes in specific places. So for example, China, um, Hungary in the 1950s, Cuba in the 1960s, Southeast Asia in the 1970s. In 1980, we finally pass whole scale um, or holistic refugee law uh, that has a cap of 50,000 refugees. But again, what drives that refugee law is fleeing or persecution related to communism. So other forms of persecution are excluded, including religious persecution, environmental catastrophe, other types of political system. And those folks get sort of caught um, sort of in this in-between space, usually uh, deemed undocumented, right? And often require advocacy to adjust their status. And I'll talk a little bit about those uh, populations in a little bit. <laughs> um, the second phenomenon is the ending of our national origins quota system. This policy was created in the 1920s. It reflected eugenical thought of the time and it dominated who could and who could not enter our country. As such, it prioritized Northern and Western European immigrants and denied certain parts of the world access to the United States completely. Asia in particular was targeted uh, in terms of American immigration law. In fact, Asian immigrants couldn't even become naturalized US citizens until 1952. Um, that's really important for many of us on this call that is within our lifetime. Um, in terms of when this sort of basically ends. It ends with the Hart Seller Act in 1965, which was a whole scale revision of American immigration policy that ended this national origin quota system and created a new system of preferences. Those preferences were tied to occupation and particularly those folks of the professional classes, um, your doctors, your lawyers, your engineers, your nurses. And in fact, even to today, nursing is the fastest way in terms of getting an expedited visa to the United States, and that's as a result of the Hart Seller Act, followed by family reunification and refugees. In addition, this particular legislation created quotas based upon hemispheres. We had 120,000 persons per year from the Western Hemisphere and 170,000 for the Eastern Hemisphere. This also creates all sorts of problems, uh, but I'll let people ask me questions about it in the chat because I don't want to drill down too deeply in terms of the law. Both of these practices, however, they are basically the foundation of our current immigration policy that we see reflected in our diversity to today. So I'd like to transition a little bit, um, but also um, come back to the communism part. Yeah. <laughs> um, the following or the remainder of this conversation is going to be based on interviews um, that were recorded uh, during uh, around 2015 and 2016 uh, for a um, grant um, that became the Alexandria Immigrant um, History Project. I've um, posted the website and the chat um, for you. And so you can read the transcripts of these um, of these oral histories um, at your leisure. Um, but in the, uh, for the rest of this conversation, when we refer to these interviews, that's what, what we're going to be talking about. Um, 
so to go back to communism, Cuba and the United States have had, let's say, like a, an interesting relationship yeah. <laughs> for a long time. I, I mean, like since, yeah, since the 19th century, but since the 1950s, um, there's there's been um, that relationship changed. And so there are two oral histories in the Immigrant Alexandria Project um, in particular that relate to uh, immigrating from Cuba. Could you give us an idea of what those experiences were like? Sure. Um, yeah, so we did two interviews, one Miriam Lechuga and the other is Nora Partlow. Now, a lot of folks probably know Nora Partlow because, of course, she's uh, the former owner, owner of, of St. Elmo's, both of whom are actually born in Cuba uh, and uh, immigrated slash came as refugees uh, in the mid uh, 20th century. Now, just, just to provide a little context, Cubans did come to this region um, as a result of the Cuban revolution, uh, revolution in 1959. Um, they, we are really the third sort of region after South Florida and the New Jersey, New York area. Um, Cubans are coming to this area in particular because Washington DC is not only our nation's capital, but it is a global capital and they are here to petition and lobby on behalf of, of refugees um, themselves, their families, etc. And so this type of pattern of refugees coming to this region in order to be advocates uh, for themselves and other refugees is a pattern we see throughout the 20th and the 21st century. And we see it really starting with Cubans. Now, Cubans don't necessarily uh, move into urban centers and we see sort of enclaving in this area. They tend to spread throughout the region, but they're upwards of a half, if not 75% of our recent immigrants by 1970. So, uh, the fact that we also found uh, Cuban immigrants in Alexandria uh, is not, not surprising. Uh, Miriam Lechuga, actually, uh, her father was the UN ambassador for Castro in the late 1950s and early 1960s, and her mother was a journalist. Um, her mother decided that things were getting too hot um, in terms of uh, journalistic freedom in Cuba and ultimately decided to leave and bring her daughter uh, with her and thus settled uh, here in the Washington metropolitan area. Nora's uh, story is actually a little different and respects uh, reflects this longer history of our relationship with Cuba. Uh, she actually came with her family um, prior to the revolution uh, and settled in New Jersey, where there was already a large number of Cuban immigrants. And again, it's tied to this long history uh, of Cubans in that area. Um, when Castro came to power, her father actually supported Castro. Uh, Fulgencio Batista was noted for his brutality, um, his denial of human rights, crimes against humanity, et cetera. And so it's not surprising that a lot of Cuban uh, Americans supported him initially. But once it became clear that he was going to be a dictator and that he was stripping people of their rights, they became disillusioned, including Nora's father. She ends up participating in what we call second secondary migration and some moves from New Jersey to the Washington metropolitan area in the 1980s. And we see this type of ph phenomenon also happening with refugees writ large, um, where they go to an initial site, often where they are sponsored by um, voluntary agencies or VOLAGs, um, and that they live there for a short period of time. And then they migrate again within the United States to certain locations based upon the pre-existing communities, job opportunities, and educational access. So again, um, this community is reflective of larger forces too. Okay, um, speaking to go back to the communism part and also kind of to reflect the, the change in the 1965 um, law, there's a, a substantial Vietnamese community in Falls Church, um, mm -hmm. and there used to be one in, in Arlington. Um, it's a lot smaller in Alexandria, um, but we do have, one interview um, regarding the, the Vietnamese community. What, what could you tell us about, about the experience of, of um, people coming from Vietnam to Alexandria? Yeah, I mean, that's also important too, because often today we think about our current demographics and we forget that actually uh, refugees and immigrants are coming in and maybe they stay for a short period of time and then they move elsewhere in the region. Um, and Southeast Asians and Vietnamese refugees in particular are reflective of that pattern. So in fact, in the late 1970s and early 1980s, there were a sizable number of Southeast Asians living uh, in Alexandria, particularly in the Arlandria neighborhood. Now, why? 
Well, it's because most refugees are finding housing in low income privately held rental units. I know that's a big mouthful. Um, they are being sort of pushed by the federal government away from what we called Section 8 at the time or public housing, uh, and they are looking for these types of rental options. Arlandria had a lot of those options uh, in the late 1970s and early 1980s and so was popular with refugees uh, writ large during that period. And in fact, Southeast Asians are not unique. Um, being in that location put them in close proximity to the major commercial area for Southeast Asians, which was actually in Clarendon. Uh, there were so many actually Vietnamese businesses in Clarendon in the late 1970s and early 1980s, it was called Little Saigon. Why? Well, those businesses ended up there because nobody wanted to own businesses there uh, with the construction of the metro. Um, of course, now these are mil multi-million dollar properties. Um, and that's ultimately what drives uh, Vietnamese refugees out of Clarendon and out of Alexandria. They end up migrating further down Wilson Boulevard and into Fairfax County and Falls Church as a result of pressures in terms of the cost of housing and access to housing that will basically afford that fits people's families and whatnot. So, so we are in many ways a sort of a stopping point uh, for a lot of refugees in that period and then they migrate to other parts uh, in the region. Um, in fact, we actually had um, a social services program known as Welcome House in what was uh, or what is still known as Warwick Village, run by a woman named Kim Cook, who um, also a Vietnamese refugee, but happened to be finishing a master's in um, social work at Catholic when uh, the fall of Vietnam uh, or fall of Saigon happened in 74. And so instead of going home and doing so social work, she became a social worker here in Alexandria. So there's a really important history there um, and that more work needs to be done. So thanks. Okay, one of the more prominent immigrant communities in Alexandria is from Central America, especially uh, from El Salvador. Um, can you give us a, a sketch of the history of that community in Alexandria, um, especially since we just talked about Arlandria? Yeah, so Arlandria is going to figure prominently in, in a lot of this uh, 20th century history. So what's interesting about South American um, immigration uh, is that the seeds of that migration, the ch what the sort of the first anchor group that uh, comes are actually women. We do not usually see women as the anchor point in terms of chain migration, uh, but in, in terms of Central Americans in this region, we do. And the reason why is that we see Salvadoran, Guatemalan, Honduran, uh, women who are working for either American Americans in USA, diplomatic corps or de, uh, defense contractors working in their home country and then being offered jobs to come with those families to the United States and often settling in the Washington metropolitan area. We see this starting in the late 1950s and the 1960s. And then once civil war starts breaking out in the late 1970s and 1980s, that is when we see an uptick of men fleeing across into the United States from Central America and coming to this region. They're coming to this region because they have family and friends already here, right? As a foundation, as a base. And that's why we see very particular demographics in terms of Central Americans in this region. It's because of that interesting federal uh, power that's at work that makes us unique than say, uh, you know, Houston or Atlanta or something like that. Now, as such, Central Americans have uh, a, a problem in terms of American refugee law. They are actually fleeing uh, governments that are being propped up by the United States. And remember, I talked about refugee policy. It's all about fleeing communist regimes. Well, uh, Salvadorans and Guatemalans in this period are not fleeing communist regimes. And as such, they are not recognized in terms of refugee status or given asylum. Um, they are considered undocumented. And it's only through their collaboration with various advocates uh, in the 1980s, plus actually uh, some lawsuits uh, that finally allow them uh, options to adjust their status uh, to have a pathway uh, to citizenship. 
In terms of this region, again, the same forces that drive Southeast Asians to live in neighborhoods like Arlandria, we also see affecting Central Americans as well. And that's why Arlandria by the late 1980s um, is called, nicknamed Little El Salvador and then becomes named Chililagua. Chililagua is actually uh, a community, a town in El Salvador, which large numbers uh, of Salvadoran refugees came from. Um, again, Chililagua is one neighborhood that uh, Salvadorans and Central Americans live in. We should note that, of course, there are other places within the city and also within the region um, that Central Americans have made uh, their home to. Um, to go back to the beginning of our conversation, uh, we had talked about how Amharic is one of the, the main languages spoken in, um, in the homes of, of Alexandria um, public school students. Um, that's not common in the rest of, of the state. Um, so kind of, can you tell us some of the reasons why people left Ethiopia and some of the reasons why they, they moved to Alexandria? Yeah, and I, I think some of our speakers can possibly speak to this uh, as well. But uh, Ethiopia, um, of course, uh, had King Haile Selassie who ruled from the 1930s until his uh, overthrow in 1974 uh, by uh, the Derg. Um, this led to uh, chaos, uh, civil war uh, between uh, pro-communist and anti-communist forces. Uh, sometime, some of this period is actually known as the Red Terror, uh, where many people of the middle classes, the professional class classes uh, were targeted by the government. Um, as a result, large numbers of Ethiopians fled. Um, um, as we see in other parts of the world. Um, unlike other places that I've talked about, however, the, the United States did not you know, send in um, military forces. And so oftentimes in our histories of, of refugees, we, we don't pay attention to uh, the Ethiopian uh, experience. Um, in terms of refugees, we see uh, a small number of folks uh, obtaining actually asylum in 1974 uh, when Haile Selassie uh, disappears. Um, and these folks in the Washington metropolitan region are, um, are students often at Howard University or Georgetown. They're members of the business community or they're part of the diplomatic corps. They are all afraid of going home and what would possibly happen to them. Then in 1980 with our sort of blanket refugee law, we see a huge number of Ethiopians coming to the United States. Um, and I do want to point out, we have one wonderful interview with Rhoda Worku. Um, a lot of you probably know Rhoda. Um, she's retired now, but she used to own Caboose Cafe in Del Rey. She actually came to the United States uh, in 1980. She was sponsored by a Presbyterian missionary and she lived in Arlandria. Uh, her family uh, was persecuted and many of them died as a result of the Red Terror. And uh, her mother in particular was absolutely, as you might, uh, apoplectic about what was gonna happen to her children and um, helped get them out of the country. She settled in this area and uh, ended up working for Bread and Chocolate, um, which some of you probably also know. Uh, and. Uh, through basically uh, her experiences there and then actually with a relationship with Nora uh, Partlow uh, ended up becoming a small business owner uh, in Delray. It's sort of, uh, a, it's a tragic story, but also a wonderful one that speaks of, you know, you know, wonderful things coming out of adversity too. Um, and she in many ways reflects larger phenomenon within uh, this particular refugee community. So our, our last question is, um, most of the immigrant populations that we've discussed are from war-torn areas of the world or are entering the U.S. as refugees or asylum seekers. Um, are there other types of immigrants coming to Alexandria? And if so, who are they? Yeah, that's, that's important. I, a lot of the phenomena I've been talking about is refugees, especially those fleeing communist regimes. That's um, one large pattern, but there are others too. In particular, uh, for this region, I'd like to point out the large numbers of military and um, foreign service spouses. This is a population that starts we see start coming after World War II in large numbers, um, but are often um, separated from immigrant communities, even though many of them actually 
uh, would benefit from the support of those uh, organizations and entities. As such, we see, for example, German immigrant women um, who do live here in Alexandria and come together, uh, often through Lutheran churches. Uh, they'll commute to Lutheran churches in and around the area that uh, provide uh, German services and also German pastries, I hear, which sounds delicious. Um, we also have large numbers of adoptees, and that's another population um, that we see in large numbers in the Washington metropolitan area. International adoption starts as a result of the Korean War, uh, where we see large numbers of orphans, many of whom are the children of American GIs. Um, War-torn areas tend to, to send a lot of uh, adoptees to the United States, but also Russia and China uh, tend to send a large number of adoptees as well. This population is imp particularly important because they are often alienated uh, from their uh, homeland, language, religion, culture, etc. Uh, and finding that type of support, both for the parents and the child, um, can be difficult. Um, but we do see large numbers in our public schools and in um, Northern Virginia writ large. And then finally, we have what we call economic immigrants. These are people who are coming for opportunities, uh, whether in terms of jobs uh, or education. Those are two phenomena that still drive a lot of our immigration to today. And in terms of the oral history project that Dan had talked uh, about, we have several examples of these types of immigrants. Uh, some of these folks, of course, you probably know. Um, Bill Patrianakos, who, uh, who just retired, he owns uh, Atlantis or he owned Atlantis. Uh, he uh, came from Greece in the late 1960s um, and is part of uh, the small sort of cadre of Greek immigrant small business owners here in the city. Um, in addition, some of you might know Dr. Shi, who used to work at Alexandria Hospital. Um, he unfortunately had passed away, but his daughter June was willing to talk about his immigrant story as well as her mother's and how uh, he came to Alexandria in the 1970s and became a medical doctor and serving the community for 30 plus years. Both of these are uh, examples of other types of immigrants that we see in our community uh, that we also need to, of course, include uh, and are, are part of the vitality uh, of the city of Alexandria, which is what makes it such a wonderful place to live. Thanks, Kristen. Okay, wow. Oh my goodness, that was incredible. Um, thank you to all of our speakers. I feel like, this is, sorry, this is Brandy with Act for Alexandria. Um, we are so fortunate to have these experts in our community. Um, and I can say as a granddaughter of immigrants, there's so many new things that I learned. And I'm so excited to dive deeper and kind of read through all the links that were shared. So we will include those in the IMPACT website under resources for this session. So be sure to check back on the site. Um, Audrey, Dan, and Kristen, I think we'll bring the three of you up here so if we can spotlight Audrey as well. Um, thank you for helping ground us in our local context. It's so important for us to learn um, about our history as we think about the present and the future. And so we wanna take a few minutes to kind of go through some of the questions that were in the chat. So Audrey, I will start with you. One question was around, what can we do to advocate for teaching African-American history in schools? I mean, I absolutely believe it's so important to teach African-American history and the history of all communities of color. And I always say that that Black history is 365 days a year. So I would lobby your, your, your teachers, your educators, uh, lobby your, your politicians. Uh, to me, it's so important because we are the foundation, not only the African-American community, but the immigrant communities that are here. We were all here. Now, some with the African-American community by force, but we contributed to this country and we helped to build not only our infrastructure, but just our knowledge base and the great African-American historians and scientists and artists that people don't know about, but the history is there. So I encourage you to do reading or in your spare, spare time, just you know, Google something so that you can learn more about these incredible people. I mean, like Friedman Mary here, how many people today knew that he had the home news uh, newspaper here in Alexandria or knew that he uh, was part of the Niagara movement. Uh, and you see these names on buildings, but 
look up Dr. Durant and what you can find out about him or Annie B. Rose, whose name is on um, the Annie B. Rose apartment building. And with Freedom House, that name will eventually change, uh, but it was named in honor of Annie B. Rose's father, who was actually enslaved in that building, uh, sold into slavery in Texas, then walked back here after uh, emancipation and found his mother some 25 years later, still living in, in Alexandria. And he set up a number of churches in Northern Virginia. It was a great, it was a really wonderful way to honor him at that time, but that building now no longer represents that story. But there are all of these hidden stories in Alexandria. So in Freedom House, we'll be highlighting that story of Henry Bailey, but also the thousands of men, women, and children trafficked through our city. And so you have a wealth of African-American history in Alexandria and it's real history. So I invite you to come out and explore it. And as we open up more, uh, we welcome you at all of our sites. Thank you, Audrey. Um, okay, another question for Dan or Kristen. Um, so what can Alexandrians do to make this a more affordable community and not drive immigrant groups out who can no longer afford to live here? Ooh, that's a tough one. Uh, I am definitely not a housing or planning uh, uh, authority, uh, but I, I can sort of point to that there are a bunch of organizations and also planning and zoning and uh, the Alexandria Redevelopment and Housing Authority who are working on um, housing affordability and accessibility. Um, and so that's something that I think we need to uh, support and pay attention to writ large, but yeah, house access to housing and affordable housing is a problem uh, that definitely impacts certain populations more than others, uh, immigrants and refugees in particular, um, especially if this is their sort of first place uh, of en entry into the United States, um, sort of getting acclimated to American life and uh, you know, language training and dealing with the trauma if they're coming from a refugee situation, all of which, you know, impacts their ability to earn money and also to afford a home. So, yeah, it's, it's really uh, um, a problem, as everybody knows on this call. Um, but it's, uh, these types of organizations, I think, need support. Um, both in terms of advocates with uh, city government, but also Richmond. Uh, Richmond probably could do more to help in terms of affordable housing and making sure people can have a, a place to live. Great, thank you. And then I know there are a lot of um, probably affordable housing experts on the call on the Zoom. So feel free to put in some of the resources. Um, we want the, the chat to be a place where we can share um, resources with each other and learn from each other. Um, so Audrey, another question for you. Will the city history exhibits that are currently on the waterfront or maybe previously on the waterfront be updated to tell more of the story and history of enslavement in Alexandria? Uh, absolutely, we are doing so much to update. So the pandemic has slowed us down, but do not worry. You will be seeing more interpretive signs around the city about African-American history. And certainly we will be addressing the waterfront. and. We also, and, I, and Kristen did mention, but she's working with the city on the history of housing. So there's some really great information that will be coming soon. And also Google Kristen Moon, because she's done some really great articles on Alexandria housing and the African-American community. So uh, that's another way also to learn about history and our out of the attic articles and research that Dan is producing. So we really want to infuse it throughout Alexandria and also check out Visit Alexandria. They have some wonderful blogs on African-American history and are dedicated to making uh, the history of Black Americans prominent in the city. Fantastic. Hey, Aud Audrey, can I just jump in? So if folks want to learn more about the interpretation of the waterfront, Audrey and I will be presenting next Saturday at 11 a.m. on Zoom as part of the city's Juneteenth uh, celebration about the African-American waterfront history trail. Uh, so uh, we will be talking about some of those important sites and on a different type of understanding of our waterfront that um, basically speaks to this particular question. So uh, I believe uh, there's been advertisements for it. Um, you can definitely check OHA's website. Uh, for, web page. Yeah. yeah, for the website and they have to register. Is you have right? to register, it's free. We have the, that at 11, our African-American Heritage Trail presentation. And at two, we have a concert by the Washington Revels Jubilee Voices, 
that will be doing uh, uh, historically African-American music, but they have grounded their concert this year in Alexandria sites. So they filmed at different Alexandria sites uh, around the city. So please join us for that as well. And then on Friday, uh, the day before Juneteenth, which is the uh, holiday, uh, we, I'm actually host, co-hosting with Virginia Humanities, a workshop with uh, Dr. Ed Ayers from the University of Richmond on making reconstruction count. Uh, it is also free and you can sign up on the Virginia Humanities website. Fantastic. That was actually one of our other questions was what was going on in the city to celebrate um, Juneteenth. So thank you for answering that. Um, one last question for Kristen. Um, someone asked about the West African immigration patterns. Could you talk a little just briefly about that? Yeah, it, that's, that is a great question. Uh, I have actually like notes uh, on other uh, language groups that are prominent in the city. Um, and so we do know, for example, Sierra Leone, uh, Eritrea, Ghana, uh, or Eritrea is actually in East Africa. Um, Ghana and Sierra Leone in particular uh, are sizable uh, linguistic groups uh, that we see uh, in terms of the community survey. We also see a lot of South Asians, by the way, uh, as well. Um, so Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India. Um, but yes, uh, this is a more recent phenomenon. Again, part of this population would be tied to refugees, per, uh, particularly civil war in, in places like Sierra Leone. But also, I didn't get to talk about it, but in the 1990s, we created a lottery system uh, for underrepresented sending countries. Uh, and that's about 50,000 slots. Um, you have to provide uh, evidence of a certain level of education. I think it's like two years of college or, or the equivalent, and then you can apply uh, to be part of that lottery system. And so we see a lot of Sub-Saharan African uh, immigrants coming through that program. And then finally, it's that preferences that I mentioned from the Heart Seller Act, especially nurses um, who are able to uh, access those expedited visas. Uh, that's a, a third component uh, that brings a large number of West Africans to, to this region too. Fantastic. Wow, I wish we could spend more time asking questions, but I want to turn it over to our um, community panel of residents who are actually now going to talk about their lived experiences in Alexandria. So if you want to take a moment, everyone, and please give thanks to Kristen, to Audrey, to Dan, maybe use the reactions um, at the bottom of your screen to show your deep appreciation. Um, we are now going to turn it over to Jacqueline Tucker, who is our city's race and 